Uh, so my name is John Willis. I go by Bachika Loop on Twitter. I, I work for a company called Instratius, cloud management company. We were recently purchased by uh, Dell, and um, and I do do a Cloud Cafe or DevOps Cafe podcast. Actually, DevOps Cafe podcast. Oh, no. If you want to check it out. I'm Kelly Wanzer. I'm the founder and CEO of Stateless Networks. Hey, Brent Salisbury, uh, Twitter at Network Static, and I blog at NetworkStatic.net. Hi, I'm Andreas Antonopoulos. I'm a solutions architect for Stateless Networks, and I specialize in security distributed systems and next generation networks. My name is Jason Edelman. I'm on Twitter at JEdelman8, and I blog at JEdelman.com. I'm Chris Market. I'm an independent network consultant, and on the Twitter, I am at Chris Market. Thank you all for joining. We're here to talk about stateless networks on the space that we're in. So stateless is part of a new generation of systems for automating networks. And we're unique in our focus on the physical network and the new architecture for programmatic interface with the networks. Uh, our product is stateless network director to give you some background. Now, we start with putting an agent on the physical network elements and also interfacing with the virtual network elements. That's allowing us to pull real-time event-driven state information on the network and compile that in a large real-time state database. And we use that database to model the network to make abstractions of the physical layer and the combined physical and virtual parts of the network and to draw that into a DevOps environment where we have a fully capable scripting layer, in our case in Ruby. And so what we're trying to do, we call it uh, network aware scripting. And so as a company, we're trying to bring DevOps to networking, and we're trying to bring network operations, uh, visibility and requirements into a DevOps environment. And so I'm really pleased to have you experts here on both sides of the table to talk about that and what you're seeing in the space. So I'll turn it over to you. I think I'll, I'll jump in. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So I met Kelly and Brent at a conference that I go to every year. It's an analyst conference in Vail by uh, Mosaic and Pacific Crest. And, uh, and what's interesting is that I've been a DevOps guy now for five years. I was at the original DevOps conference in Ghent. I've been the keynote speaker at almost every DevOps conference around the world. Um, and so when I started talking to Kelly, and I met Brent, I actually met Brent early, and talked about some of the challenges you were having in networking, and, and I was fascinated because he's doing things like continuous delivery, he's starting to, he's a polygot, right? Which are all the things like, wow, that's what the sysadmins were doing, this is amazing. And then I had this great debate with Kelly, could DevOps work in the network engineering world? And we really batted heads, and, and she just got me so inspired about what they're doing, and the problem they're trying to solve, and it's so similar to a problem I've been solving in five years with the sysadmin space. In the, in the how do you, you know, how do you increase efficiency? How do you build abstract layers? How do you build test-driven models, flows? All the things that we've learned over the five years. And so it's been fascinating to see Stateless attacking this problem um, from, a, you know, kind of a cultural and technology space. And, you know, and I've, been, I've gotten to know Brent over the time. We've done some podcasts together. And, expanded these ideas right I mean yeah no I mean it's it, it was funny because it's it, you've already lived this <laughs> so it's like we're kind of feeling our way in the dark uh, so I know it's so there's definitely some guys out there there's Derek Winkworth um, uh, some of the Jeremy Shulman some of the guys out there are actually really starting to uh, put a lot of put a lot of time and effort into kind of getting the DevOps model going uh, I know from like my perspective been doing a lot with open daylight so it's like I see this, you know, CI continuous integration tools. I see, uh, you know, regression testing. All you know, all the things that software has been doing for years, and we just didn't do it. We still, when you hit the enter button, you have no idea what's going to happen to the state of the network. Uh, so we've got to improve that, and it's a little scary. <laughs> and looking at stateless, you mentioned agent on the devices. Yeah. You know, there's in Cisco Admin world, there's puppet agents, there's chef agents, mm -hmm. and Cisco has now an agent for one PK. How would you compare? I guess, with what Stateless is doing versus what's been done already for years in the CIS world, as well as comparing it to something like a 1PK? Well, I think the what's really unique about the way um, we work in agents and the network element device is that the role of the agent is twofold. On the one hand, it's to apply configuration and, and make changes to the device, essentially execute the vision or policy you have on the network element. But in order to do that successfully, you have to be able to uh, reflect that network state back 
into our model so you can do the, the necessary scripting and, and health checks and checkouts, uh, which allow you to do the continuous integration. Because the, the, the problem with um, uh, configuration type agents is that you throw the configuration at it, and then you don't have any feedback as to how that works. Now, on a system, it's slightly different. On a system, I mean an operating system or a server. Um, because the, the interaction between that server and the other servers around it is relatively limited. Even if you have a multi-tier application, then it gets a bit more hairy. But generally speaking, the dependencies are not that tight. In a network, the element itself is almost irrelevant in the big picture. The dependencies are much tighter. So having that feedback of the network state at great detail and in real time is critical. So our agent is not just there to execute, it's there to execute in a in a closed loop, where you can very quickly respond to changes and remediate issues in an automated fashion. And I think that's an important point of why I'm so interested in this, what they're trying to do. I'm a junkie for this, right? I just live for, for these type of attacks and problems, right? And big problems excite me. And, and I think the thing here is, when you talk about Chef and Puppet, I mean, and I, I was the ninth person in an ops code. I, I, I live the chef puppet world. That, I, that was my first phase of that evangelism, of abstraction layers, systems yeah. configuration, right? Now it's abstraction layers of switches and, and interface definitions and ports to VLANs and whatever, right? Um, it's the same arguments. But the thing that, that what I like about Stateless, from, from a chef and puppet, they're still attacking the problem from a systems view, right? So they're abstracting like port to VLAN stuff. They're doing certain configuration stuff with Juniper and Arista, right? But what they're not doing is to the point you're making is, not, they don't have the, the comprehensive topology knowledge. So the idea of this product is more than just, and, and those products have purposely stayed away from being more than one product, right? Monitoring is done. Chef and Puppet do not become monitoring products. It just doesn't make sense. Monitoring products don't become configuration products because that's done, Chef Puppet, right? But the beauty here is in this new space, you can actually self-define yourself as a monitoring, big data, and configuration provisioning tool. And, and, and combine all that kind of knowledge and topology to do you know, the, some of the extraordinary stuff you were telling me about yesterday and, and you know, what you were just talking about. It's, so that makes we are, sense. The, well, those, those DevOps tools enabled us to stop treating servers as unique individual systems and start treating them as elements that play a role in the infrastructure. So it's not about this server, it's about the database server. This one has a role as a database server or an application server or a logging server or whatever. But in the network, a role is a position in a topology. It doesn't just happen out of the blue. Its, it's position in the topology is its role. And so what you're doing, in fact, is backing from the topology to the role that that element plays, and then applying a configuration that's relevant. Uh, and that's a very different way of doing things, because you have to see not only what change you created within that element, but what changes need to be created in the elements around it so the topology functions again correctly? Uh, is it properly balanced? Does it have the right uplinks and downlinks? Are, they, are those links balanced? Do they have the aggregation links across, etc.? So it's, it's much more complex than simply assigning a role to a device. Um, you have to think about so, it holistically. So architecturally, you know, right now it would be great to have an agent, I guess, on every vendor's device. Third party stateless can now control and get visibility everywhere. Or do you look at Brent and I can just see Open Daylight and OVSDB sitting in front of me? Or do you communicate the director right to there. the controller? Mm -hmm. or, or, is, or is it directly to the agent on the device to get that abstraction from a device level or a network level? You know, how do you, how do you sort? Well, don't, so I think that, I mean, I get so excited when John starts talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've been guessing at this for a while and, you know, he's just already done it. So. Uh, but so we're kind of going to this trend of open systems, right? So we've got Cumulus, we've got Arista. Right. Arista today can only go on their hardware. I fully expect somebody like Arista will let their signaling to decouple from the hardware and say we sell a network operating system. Uh, it, it, Juniper sort of is there open-wise, but you know, I, I think it's a done... Because it, we kind of got the, this SDN paradigm on one side where we're really focused on decoupling control, and, but then, then on the far side there's this open systems movement and both, I think, are totally complementary. You see, another. just a quick Linux apt get install the agent, 
yeah. on Cumulus, yeah. on Arista, whatever sense, it is. Right? We don't we we don't go by servers because a server that only has Microsoft SQL on it. Yeah. I mean, when you say it to when you put when you tell a systems person, it's like, what the hell is wrong with you? All? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I was talking to somebody in Europe. I was at a DevOps Days conference in Israel, and I was trying to explain your technology to yeah. them at first, and I was doing it really badly, right? And uh, and because I didn't make the meta point that that, that you guys are just driving in on, which is. But he's like, well, that's going to be hard. Because you kept thinking right. all the hardware right. and closed box stuff. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, forgot to tell you. They're really focusing yeah. on the new trend, you know, which makes life so much easier and manageable. Like, in, to your yeah. point, an open world, a, a more Linux-based, you know, m modular. But to, Bre to Brent's point, which is really interesting, you have these open systems emerging. And it, they're, they're having a great time, like, in the hyperscale environments and the, the sort of DIY, the cloud guys. And they start to go down to you know data center operators of all types and say, oh, here you can pro you can program to our switches, yeah. you can program to open daylight. Here's another controller you can program to, and so and and from a from a DevOps point of view of making this stuff work, like we kind of want to unify and abstract across that. So you've got a unified Ruby scripting layer where you can mm -hmm. see the whole network, and and you know and and you can interoperate with the pieces underneath it without having to figure out how do I go and code to each of these elements. Yeah, no, that's, so. well, that's a great point because it's, I think we get caught up in, oh, well, Google did this, so we should be doing this, right? But really, the enterprise needs product and it needs polished product and it doesn't. And, and there, yeah. the, the pool of developers to develop this stuff, you know, is only so big. It's, so. That's the thing, right? They, they, you know, yeah. people mention, well, we need to start thinking about being more like Google and Facebook, and, yeah. right? Well, that's easy because, you know, if you look at, you know, the kind of engineers they hire yeah. and who they get to hire, like, we can't all be like Google, yeah. right? Well, right. they do more R&D than most vendors. <laughs> but Can it's you funny because... some examples of the closed loop, uh, uh, you know, mm -hmm. event detection and then respond and reconfigure stuff? Right, absolutely. So um, let, let's compare this to kind of the, when you see some of these new next generation devices, they look like a Linux operating system. They are a Linux operating system. So let's start treating them as servers. We'll, you know, push and pop it to it and done. It doesn't work because it's not a server. It's part of a topology, as I said before. And so um, what we're looking at is, for example, let's say you're trying to deploy, like in most data centers, you have a highly, highly structured network infrastructure. It's not a pool. It's not elastic. It's elastic in terms of capacity or port utilization, but the switches are arranged or the routers are arranged in a very, very specific so the, topology. The topology and the, and the role. Exactly. The, so, yeah. so um, you need to identify and map that so that when you push a configuration, you can look at what ripple effect that has across the entire topology. If you just slap a layer of virtualization on top of that and try to hide the details, then any change you make that causes problems is going to bubble through that. And so, for example, um, in our environment, you could take a leaf spine, te a spine leaf uh, topology, pull out one of the leaf switches, throw it out of the sixth floor uh, window, hoping no one's downstairs, and replace it with a completely blank device plug all the network connections in. And simply from its location within the discovered topology around it, we will recognize that that's a field replacement for the previous device. We'll be able to restore the previous configuration and relationships with its neighbors, recalibrate all the routes, aggregation links, uplinks, and bring it back to a healthy topology. So the element will be able to fulfill its role within the broader topology. It goes from simple things like, is there an network time server defined, do you have the AAA authentication, is it correctly configured for DNS, all the way up to um, are the aggregation links between two switches working, uh, or much more complex things, because you can simply script to any of the attributes in the data model. Now, now that's configuration management, but it doesn't didn't seem to address the, the closed loop part of it, which is what I think is the most interesting, is reacting to something that we've noticed happening and, well, and you know, so, making the so, config change so appropriate. Kind of, there are kind of two sides to the coin. So when you're doing provisioning and maintenance on the network, you know, we think that you need that dynamic feedback loop mm -hmm. if you're going to be operating on the live network, right? Because sure. whatever you're working on is connected to other things. It's got traffic flowing on it. It's got um, it's got things that are linked above it, and so we want awareness of all that, even to perform maintenance, whether it's software upgrades, whether it's changing configurations, and so on. 
And so there's that dynamic feedback part of it which is missing from Puppet and Chef. And so even in a maintenance or provisioning mode, it's relatively limited in terms of its use on a live network. Then when you get to what you're talking about, which is where you get some really interesting both preventative and incident response automation. Right. We get asked a lot about you know, incident response automation where I see congestion or I have an outage. You know, can I automatically bleed traffic away? Could I see what looks like an attack and could I automatically isolate you know, this rack? And, and potentially taking advantage of some of these new capabilities. I mean, these new next generation network elements have tremendous abilities to to do things you couldn't do before. So, for example, being able to do uh, congestion management on a port, identify congestion, and then start capturing a microsecond time synced accurate PCAP of the congestion on that port to identify exactly what traffic is causing it. Well, we can do that in a responsive way. So when we identify congestion, we can then go back, change the configuration, start capturing more data on specific ports, or reactively tell vCenter to move some traffic away by, by reallocating some of the uh, servers that are above that switch. That's exciting stuff. Mm -hmm. Is there so there's a lot of data center centric? Is there a um, you know WAN use cases and and this kind of thing too that are so we're that data, are as compelling? We're data center focused I today, see. so there's a there's a lot of upside in these improvements in the data center, and there's a pretty big wave of refresh that's happening. Mm -hmm. Yes, we get asked a lot about the WAN, and there's there's plenty of opportunity there too. But we're, we're focused need, on that we, problem first. We need elements. Yeah, yeah. You, need, yeah. You, need, you, yeah. you need things you Good can program first, right? right? Yeah. That's the if, if we problem. start seeing highly programmable elements in the WAN, right. then that will be our. Yeah. So a lot of it depends on well, right. having but, the agent on yeah. some white box. It's, it's, it's an even larger problem. That, it's the philosophy. Well, the yeah. industry is we're, we're totally held hostage by bro, by Broadcom. There's there's one merchant silicon vendor. That means there's one set of you know commodity hardware that people can just slap operating systems on. We don't have that anywhere else. It's broken. What do you see as you know? If we look talk about point of control, there's a lot of discussion on Open Daily, NSX, different platforms owning control. So you know, is, is the is the vision to extract data via the agent and the feedback loop coming back down to go through the point of control, or is it to communicate it back directly to the agent? And that's the part that is still very new in the industry yeah. to see how that could play out, or is it to sort of so one of the be able to do everything. One of, our insertion point is almost at the opposite end of the spectrum from a controller. So so we we can insert a stateless in a very lightweight, very non-invasive way to start to monitor what's happening and provide you know faster, more granular information, including in the introduction of overlay and controller environments, so we can monitor what's happening and cross-check it against what then should be happening. And so, so that's our, our, our first order activity is, is to kind of be, you know, be a watcher and at a point where policies can be execute, executed or automation across. You know, and, and we talk to people, it's not clear whether there will be you know, single controller or multiple right. controllers, right. Right. whether there will be a sing, single infrastructure platform or multiple. And, and, and that's a question that arises when you have these monolithic uh, siloed network management and network monitoring systems. We've designed an architecture that is very much in the vein of modern application architectures, loosely coupled components connected by asynchronous message buses and queues, with both internal and external APIs. The application is turned inside out. And that means that you don't have to have only one control point at the top, and then it flows all the way through a monolithic application to the element. You can connect at various different layers within our application, so that you can use some of your existing perhaps configuration or service management or workflow capabilities. And you have all of these rich APIs, because it's designed as a loosely coupled application, not a block. And, you know, my CEO, the, the company I work for now, was says, "Don't let great be the enemy of the good." Right. Right. And, and so the thing is, like, even in when, to bring it back to DevOps, right? Which is, like, we're still, you know, we talk about abstractions of servers and 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 then higher order abstractions of tiered structures like LAMP stacks and Java stacks, right? Like, so like we're still a smaller percentage of the whole world large code world is even really up to there where they're right. chef and puppetizing and right. they completely abstracted, right? Like when you talk to the people in engineering work, we're like zero world. So like the sixth server, you know, throw the server out, right? Yeah. Um, uh, Martin Fowler, one of the original agile 
Agile 14 manifesto guys wrote a landmark paper called Immutable Servers, mm -hmm. right? And he had this idea of Immutable Server, right? And, and that's taken time to sink in of what, is, what does Immutable Server mean in an infrastructure? Can, you, can it just be rebuilt? Like, I mean, I've never heard anybody say the word Immutable Network Devices, right? Mm -hmm. You know, until you start. We had our conversation yesterday exactly. about fungible network devices. Or in, in DevOps, it's gone even further. It's gotten to the point where you have active, uh, active processes on purpose taking out bits of the infrastructure you to get right, resilience. Like, yeah, yeah, like you're chaos right. monkey, right? Right, exactly. I mean, chaos monkey, for, like, yeah. I, I don't want to get, well, I do want to get Brent started. Like, what is, <laughs> what is chaos but monkey you, in, in the network? The network doesn't we got do a that. long way to go, yeah, right? Yeah, I mean, we already had the chaos yeah. monkey. Yeah, it's, yeah. Just, it's everything being destroyed. Yeah, and it's already out. Yeah. <laughs> it's a network. Statically of configured, yeah. yeah. Absolutely, just, yeah. All yeah. it takes is one yeah. CLI access by by someone and a human error happens. So your chaos monkey is destroyed. We want to go, that's what we, we kind of got to where Netflix today purposely, I mean, that, that's an evolution, right? An evolution to where you get to a place where it's not happy because of chaos. It is chaos, the fine chaos, to make you anti-fragile, right? right no, exactly. So, um, and, um, and we're at exactly the opposite end of the spectrum on the network, but the thing is we can see the end goal. We know the journey. You know what it looks like, it's right? already been traveled by the sysadmin group. Yeah, yeah. There's a slight difficulty here because the culture of network operations and dev operations is much more distant than sysadmins and devops. Well, but yeah, I was thinking about this this morning, right? So it's kind of I think like it's turtles all the way down, right? Like the engineers. Oh, is it? Just the, got to an exciting the, topic. Yeah, the classic <laughs> part, the classic story in devops was the software engineers. The, the slow point for them was the ops guys. Mm -hmm. Well, then all of a sudden we got we kind of started solving that, and then the infosec guys got involved. Right. And so to the ops guys, the infosec guys are the slow guys, right? But you know what? To the whole world, it's the net engineers who are the slowest, right? Mm -hmm. Like you guys are the last. Like you know, everybody complains about well, that's the part where we can do all this, but you know, how are we going to get network? But apology provision. From a stateless point of view, we, we, we see the network engineers as the guys who keep things running. And so the missing piece is to give them what they need, give them the visibility that they need, the feedback that they need, so that you know, they're the guys on the hook at the end of the day for the 3 a.m. phone call and the application outage. And so this missing piece of feedback is the sort of is the way I think the DevOps community can say to network engineers, this is okay to roll forward. You know, this is going to be good for you. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how we see it, and uh, and this is a fantastic discussion, and I would like to carry it on, but I think we may be a bit rate limited. So <laughs> thank you all for joining us, and we would like to talk again, and appreciate the ongoing interest in the dialogue of DevOps meet NetOps. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Awesome.